Hi folks, we're going to talk about sound intensity and decibels. So how do we determine the power or the loudness of a sound? Um, it's kind of complicated and it's complicated because it involves multiple things. It involves the intensity of the sound, the, the level of the sound, and these are not the same, so we're going to go into that. And it also depends to some extent on how the ear hears different frequencies. We do not respond to, the human ear does not hear all frequencies with the equivalent correctness. So how do we tell the difference between a loud sound and a quiet sound? So let's begin by talking about sound intensity. When a sound wave is generated, it actually does work on the air. Now, if you remember our discussions about doing work, that means exert a force through a distance. So a speaker or vocal cords are going to physically move air uh, by applying a force to it. That speaker cone is going to oscillate in and out and cause the air to move a certain displacement x by doing some work on it. And that's going to then make these air molecules move um, and they're going to take some time to travel from the source to the receiver. Well, if you have work done per unit time, that's power. And if you remember from long ago when we were talking about this, power is measured in watts. So this is basically energy that is the amount of energy input per unit time. Now, energy input per unit time is only part of the sound intensity discussion. Once that sound is produced, sound waves are produced um, like a lot of wave sources. If you, if, I like to envision turning on a light bulb. So if here's a little light bulb and you turn that light bulb on, the light is going to go out in big concentric circles. In bigger circles, it's going to go outward from the source um, at the speed of light. Well, a sound wave is going to go outward from the source at the speed of sound. And it's going to spread out in all directions from that source. Now, when it does that, it's going to follow the inverse square law. We've talked about the inverse square law when we were dealing with gravity. Light always also does this. Um, Wave intensity, wave power also does this. So if you have the source of a noise, um, there is going to be some work done, a work force applied over a period of time, and that is going to spread outward in kind of a conical fashion, like going through a section of a cone from the source. And if you double the distance, you're going to have 1 over 2 squared, 1 quarter the intensity, the strength, the power. If you triple the distance, you're going to have 1 over 3 squared, or 1 ninth the intensity of that sound wave. So what we end up with for an equation for wave intensity, it is actually the energy. Now energy, if you remember, is work divided. So energy is, is work that's done to the air per unit of time that flows through a square meter of area. And since work per unit time equals power, we have an equation for wave intensity that is power in watts per unit area. And this is from our source, our speaker of a musical speaker or a human speaker or a puppy barking, whatever it works. But this is the equation for wave intensity. So it is a flow of energy from a source that is getting spread out over a larger quantity of area the further and further it spreads. Now human hearing uh, the threshold of human hearing is this value. Please write this number down. You're going to need this. I suggest you, you put it on your um, either your orange sheet or your formula sheet, one of the sheets you're going to need for uh, to use on tests and homework. And this is the threshold of human hearing. This is the minimum energy necessary to produce a response in the human ear. And this is based on uh, a lot of experimentation that has been done on human ears, just generically about the anatomy 
of a human ear. It takes that much power to begin the process of hearing to move this tiny little membrane that ears is the eardrum. That is an incredibly small amount of power. Uh, what it means is that our ears are so sensitive, we can detect the motion of an air molecule down to one-tenth the diameter of an atom. Phenomenally sensitive your ears are, just absolutely amazing. We humans can hear in a range from about 20 to 20,000 hertz. Again, this is determined by the geometry of a human hear ear. Everyone's going to be slightly different because of the fact that we've been exposed to different situations, and because of that we may have slightly different hearing losses. Um, all creatures do not have the same range. This is the range for humans. Uh, different animals are going to have slightly different ranges. Some do not have the low end. Some do not have the high end. Uh, dogs, dolphins, of course, have amazing and phenomenal hearing. Anything above 20,000 hertz is ultrasonic, hence DMS or ultrasound as an imaging technique. And anything below 20 hertz is referred to as infrasonic, very, very low frequencies. Human hearing is also not sensitive to all frequencies equally across the 20 to 20,000 hertz range. This diagram is a really phenomenal diagram. Um, these are sound levels and decibels. We'll get to those in a moment. And this is also a log graph. So we go 10, 20, 30, this is 40, 50, this is 100, and then we go to 200, 300, 400, 500, then 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 10,000. At the end of it, it's 20,000. This is a logarithmic scale. This is a log graph paper. And uh, the way this, what this tells us is low frequencies, anything below about 1,000 hertz, you and I are not terribly good at hearing. They have to be very, very loud. They have to have a a lot of wave energy before the human ear is going to respond. We are very good at hearing things from 2,000 to about 4,000 hertz. Right in here, this is the area where it takes a very small amount of wave energy to oscillate that human eardrum. In this section, of course, we're going to have pretty good human hearing, and that's where you and I do most of our life, most of our conversation, most of the hearing we need is going to be in this range. The high end, uh, we're better on the high frequency end above 10,000 to 20,000 than we are on the low frequency end, but because this requires very fast high oscillations in the human ear, we can lose this quickly. And as you may be aware, older people who, old parts, parts, parts wear out with continuous use, um, older people tend to lose some of those frequencies. Now, the decibel is the official unit of sound level. Uh, actually, the official unit of sound level, now notice I'm not saying loudness, I'm saying level, is the bell. And it's named after this fellow, Alexander Graham Bell, an American inventor who invented the telephone. But his mom became deaf when he was 12 years old. Uh, she gradually went deaf due to an illness, and he observed that occurring. And so throughout his entire life, he worked a lot with the hearing impaired community. Um, and because of his work with sound, this unit of sound level was named after him. Now, a bell is an incredibly large unit. And so you will almost always hear deci bells. If you remember from our metric prefixes, a deci equals one tenth. So one tenth of a bell, a deci bell, is what we're going to deal with most of the time. This is the equation you and I are going to use to calculate decibels. Uh, capital B is for sound level in decibels. Uh, 10 times the base 10 log of the intensity of a sound in watts per meter squared divided by the threshold of hearing 1 times 10 to the negative 12 watts per meters squared. So in the next video, we're going to use this and do some calculations. But let's take a few minutes and talk about different decibel ratings for different things. This is a nice little decibel chart. Uh, if you're talking about something quiet, like a whisper, about 20 dB, uh, piano practice, about 65, a nice conversation in a quiet office, 50, 60 dB.
Things that start getting loud, a vacuum cleaner is about 80. A blender, factory noise can be over 100. By time you get up to lawn mowers and power saws, you're over 110. And you start getting to loud dances and bars, you're up to 115, 120. And if you get way the heck up here, front row of a rock concert, I think is fascinating. That's about the same as a jet engine. Wow, that's painful. Um, very, very loud sounds. Now, the thing that's interesting about this, this is a logarithmic scale. And what that means is a change of 10 decibels means 10 times more power. So if you go from 80 to 90 dB, it's not just a little bit more powerful. Something that is 90 dB compared to 80 dB means that the 90 is 10 times more intense, 10 times more wattage hitting your ear, 10 times more energy hitting your ear. If you go to a change of 20 decibels, 80 to 100, that is going to be 10 to the second or 100 times more powerful. If you go 80 to 110, that's 80 minus 110. Difference there is 10 to the third. So that's going to be three zeros. That is a thousand times more powerful. So a small change in decibel rating means a huge change in the amount of energy actually hitting your ear. Scales you may have encountered that are similar to this are pH and chemistry and the Richter scale if you've ever studied earthquakes. Those are also logarithmic scales. Now, what about hearing loss? Well, this is a lovely chart. Um, if you hear quiet things like conversation, raindrops, rustling leaves, those are not going to hear your, hurt your hearing. But there is a time component for hearing loss. Um, if you are exposed to anything that's 85 decibels or greater, the OSHA regulations that look after workers' safety says anything that's 85 decibels that's continuously ongoing background noise, uh, you're going to need hearing protection because it can result in permanent hearing loss. So let's say that you are riding a motorcycle. Um, if you are doing that for 15 minutes, not a big deal. If you're going to do that for eight hours, now that's possibly then you're going to have a risk to hearing. So what actually happens in the ear? Inside of the cochlea of the ear, that little snail-shelled piece, there are a whole bunch of little cilia. These cilia are like little hairs. And if they get continuously hit by high-energy sounds, they get knocked over. Now, with rest, they can very often recover. But if they get hit with a lot of high-energy sounds, continuously, what happens is they not only recover, they can break off. And if they break off, you're done. You will not hear those frequencies ever again. And that's why there are different time limits. So there can be some recovery from some of these lower decibel noises, but if you're going to go to one of these professional football games where yelling is part of it, um, I suggest that you bring some earplugs to protect your own hearing uh, because that is possible that some of your little stilia might possibly break and never come back. All right, that will do for this one. Next time we're going to do some math with decibels and logarithms.